Okay, so we'll talk about um, structural uh, structural analysis now. So first thing we need to do is we need to look at the different different kinds of elements that we've got uh, got available to us. So we've seen the uh, we've seen one D beams when we did the uh, the space frame, both when I created it from um, from scratch and then uh, when I defeatured that uh, that space frame. So we've also got um, 2D or shell elements as they're called. So here we model with um, bodies with, with which don't have a thickness. So they're basically um, just surfaces essentially. And then those surfaces are assigned a property which is the, uh, the surface thickness or the shell thickness. So then when this is turned into a, um, a finite element mesh, that thickness is essentially the behaviour. Just like when we have a line, that line is assigned a cross section. Let me just grab my pen. So if this uh, beam had, say, an I beam, that would be the cross section, so that defines its uh, its stiffness. Just like when you have a um, a surface, the thickness defines its um, its stiffness. So there's additional information that you have to give to both the 2D shell and the 1D beam. Whereas when we have a 3D solid, yeah, it's as it is. You you mesh it, and then that fully represents the um, the stiffness and the uh, and the geometry. So there's no additional uh, additional information. So there's a, a few different things that go into a structural analysis besides the uh, besides the geometry. So uh, material properties are the is the primary one. So inside uh, the, uh, the software, there's a, a pre-built material library. So uh, by default, everything is given the property of structural steel. So most of the time, you're going to have different material properties, and you can choose from a material library to define different, um, different material, uh, material properties. So then, the uh, most important thing is the assigning of the loads and uh, and supports. So we have to do this to um, to fully define our problems. So these are essentially our uh, our boundary conditions. So there's a, a snapshot of some of the uh, the loads and uh, and supports that we can uh, we can apply to a, a model. So uh, in the demonstration, we can't obviously cover all of these, but. Um, you normally have to take uh, what exists in reality and convert it to what exists in this uh, in this list. So most of the time, you uh, you can convert those loads fairly easily because you can just make it uh, a little bit more generic than it uh, than it is in uh, in reality. Okay, so once we do a um, a structural analysis, probably the most important thing to do is to identify, I'm just going to let that animation play again, is to see if your uh, your results actually make, uh, make sense. So um, you start looking at things like, uh, like deflections. Um, is the structure deflecting in the correct, uh, correct way? Uh, so with this animation, if it will let me play it again, Okay, so um, uh, this sort of seal sort of pops through there. So let me just switch back to the other view. Okay, so if I play this animation, this seal sort of pops through that uh, that gap. So based off the loading, you would have some sort of expectation of what's going to uh, what's going to happen. So if you looked at the uh, the reaction forces, you might expect there to be um, no resistance when it's just sort of starting to pop through the gap, and then so when there's a free movement, there'd be no um, no real reaction force. Then once it starts squeezing through the gap, you'd expect there to be uh, an increase in the um, in the force taken to um, to pop through the gap. So here, when we're animating the results gives us an idea of what's uh, what's going on rather than a um, a static snapshot of what's going on right at the end. Look, if I, if I go there, I can't really see what's going on beforehand. So uh, you need to uh, 
often uh, often look at that uh, in terms of what's gone on in the load history. Okay, there we go. Now the animations are playing. So. Um, so that was a, sort of a linear model. So what can happen is sometimes your models can have non-linear behaviour. So here we've got a, a red line. This is the response of our structure. So as we apply force, it will have a certain displacement, but that's not a linear relationship. So a lot of the time models have this, what we call non-linear behaviour. So um, at each point along that curve, there's a, a certain uh, stiffness. We call it a um, we call it a tangent stiffness. So this is essentially the characteristic stiffness of the structure at that point in its uh, in its displacement. So we have to um, often calculate what the um, the stiffness of the structure is at each point along it, having the uh, the load being uh, being applied. So in terms of what makes behaviour non-linear. So there can be things about the geometry that make the model non-linear. So as your structure deforms, it will have a, a new stiffness. So if you think of a, um, let's bring it in uh, formula SAE terms, if you've got a spring in your suspension and the coils uh, compress and then they touch, so those coils are effectively locked out. So that gives you a non-linear spring. So as you apply displacement, the more displacement you apply, your spring stiffness changes. So that can happen with uh, geometry as well. As the shape changes, the stiffness changes. So that's yeah, what we call a geometric uh, nonlinearity. So, uh, or another classic example is a, uh, a fishing rod. So in its um, undeformed state, uh, if you pull down the tip, it's not very uh, not very stiff, but as you distort the uh, the fishing line more and more, it starts to pick up uh, pick up stiffness. So the more and more load you apply, it gets displaced from its uh, from its starting position, and its stiffness uh, increases. So that has a um, an increasing stiffness. So you can have the opposite effect where your um, structure gets softer as you apply more and more uh, more displacement. But both of those are, uh, are geometric nonlinearities because you have to recalculate what your characteristic stiffness is based off the deformed shape. So another type of nonlinearity is uh, material nonlinearity. So most of the time you want to be uh, operating within the elastic range of your uh, material. So your strains are normally quite small in the elastic uh, range. But once you start getting into um, the plastic region of a material or the nonlinear region after you've gone past the uh, the yield stress, your strains start becoming quite uh, quite significant, and you need to uh, recalculate what your overall stiffness of your structure is. So if you think of a um, a metal bar in a in a tensile test, as you're stretching it when it's elastic and then you let go of that load, it will spring back to its initial position. But you can predict what the displacement will be. If you double your load, your stress will double, therefore the uh, displacement will double, if it's still within the elastic range. But once you go into the, uh, the non-linear region or the plastic uh, range, you can't, you can't as easily predict what the um, uh, what the stress is going to be based off the previous stress because you have to update what your um, effective uh, Young's modulus is in the, uh, in the non-linear or the plastic uh, region. So the third type of uh, non-linearity is what we, uh, we call contact non-linearity. So again, taking it back to the, uh, the spring uh, example. So if you look at the uh, the springs as you as they as it compresses, the coils start touching each other. So initially, when the springs in its um, undisturbed state, there'll be no contact between the uh, the adjacent coils. So if you as you start compressing the spring, those coils might start touching each other. So uh, when they're touching, that changes the uh, the load path and it changes the characteristic stiffness of your uh, of your 
overall structure. So if I just quickly rewrite the uh, uh, equation of motion. So this is our stiffness matrix. So the stiffness matrix has inputs from, let me just redraw it here. So all three of these things feed into our stiffness matrix because the stiffness matrix is a function of the geometry, it's a function of the material properties and it's a function of the, uh, the contacts. So what parts are in contact and what parts are not in contact. So if any one of these change a lot, it changes the stiffness matrix. So based off your initial conditions, they're now no longer valid. So you need to recalculate that, um, that stiffness. Okay, so, so what I'll do now is another, uh, another demonstration of just setting up a, uh, a structural analysis and I'll try and make it um, uh, relevant to um, a formula SAE as well. So 